How's the sound level? Can't tell if uh, if the music is too quiet or not because it's not piping into my headphones. So perfect. Okay, good. How's it going, Samsung? Uh, is colorizing an art or a science? I'm gonna go with art. Uh, even though I'm looking at science, I sort of feel like um, what we're doing requires some creativity um, and a lot of sort of artistic decision-making. You can colorize stuff and make it look pretty hideous, in my opinion. And I've done it before, so I know. But um, uh, having a good sense of color is really kind of critical. So figure out if my cat let itself into the room with me. Hey Pacific, how was your dinner? What'd you make? I skipped lunch, I know how that goes. All right. Uh... Ooh, beans and Korean barbecue with squash. That sounds good. Okay, give me a second to sort of get things situated. Uh, let's see. I think what I want to do is just sort of hide the OBS from myself so it's not interfering with it. Hey, Steve. Costco chicken tonight. First time, not bad for $5. All right. Uh, let's see. So first of all, let me say by, uh, that um, when I colorize stuff, uh, I have a bunch of different techniques that I sometimes use. And more or less recently, I've figured out how to do most of what I do in, um, in just Photoshop. So uh, I have to admit that Photoshop is not normally my first tool, that I do a lot of photo editing. And so um, Lightroom is really my sort of most comfortable tool. Um, and I, I really know how to do most of the things that I want to do with photography in Lightroom. Um, it's just part of the Adobe Creative Suite and um, it's used for editing, you know, photographs. So th that's where my, um, my primary skill set sort of lands. I've been using Lightroom for, I don't know, maybe a year and a half now. And before that, I was mostly using GIMP to do it. Um, and then I realized that my university actually um, has access to all the Photoshop tools and um, and so I could get everything on uh, on my computer at home and on my com on my iPad and on my laptop um, at no cost. Yeah, GIMP's kind of a pain. I was also using some stuff on my um, on my iPad by itself. So I was just using this sort of free version of Lightroom that's from Adobe that you can use on your iPad. So that was sort of like my primary tool for a really long time. And I've used Photoshop before, it's just I hadn't used it recently. 
And so I've been adapting most of the things that I do to Photoshop, and I think it's actually added a lot of power to, um, to my tool set uh, and a lot more options because Lightroom doesn't really give you some sort of selecting power, at least not on the iPad, it didn't. And it, it's mostly like, you know, taking care of the whole photo as one piece. Whereas um, there's a lot of really cool tools in, in Photoshop that are a lot simpler and easier to use um, if you know what you're doing. And so I've just sort of been training myself how to use some of those features. And I get a lot of people that ask me like, how do I colorize the diatom images? So, um, and every other kind of image that I, I use. So um, I thought maybe I would just do this and then, um, you know, you know, I'm not an expert at any of these tools, but I feel like you don't need to be to really play around with things. And I think that's really like a critical component of, um, of art in general. And in particular, trying to get, you know, what you want from whatever you're doing. And, um, and I recommend just like going in and playing with things. Um, you know, if you, if you've got a, a backup of the ori original image, you can do whatever you want. And then, uh, you know, if you make it look terrible, you can always go back to the original and start over. Um, first thing is that uh, whenever you take a picture on the SEM, you get this little tag at the bottom that just built into the image. So like my first step is always get rid of it. Um, and that's an easy thing to do. You can just go into the image and, and click crop and it'll get rid of that. Uh, the tools are also um, cheating and showing you things that I don't want to show you just yet. Um, so that's step one, and that's the same step in Lightroom. And if people really want me to show the Lightroom side of it, I can. Um, I think I just need to pop open something and uh, and add it to the, the browser um, for, um, for OBS. So step one, you have a black and white image, and um, in this case from the SEM, and uh, well, so when I do it on my iPad, I usually do because it doesn't have uh, like the Photoshop on my iPad's not really got all the tools that I want. So I usually just stick with Lightroom and then I export stuff into um, Procreate. And I can do all the gradient tools and all the things that I normally do in, um, in either the desktop version of Lightroom or now the desktop version of Photoshop in Procreate. And so um, that's sort of what I've been doing is kind of bouncing back and forth between Procreate and Lightroom, sort of get it kind of how I want in, in Procreate and then export it back to Lightroom. And they just um, pass the image back and forth between them very easily. So I would just keep editing and bouncing them back and forth between those two programs until I kind of got it where I wanted. Um, one of the things that's not uh, intuitive about um, Lightroom, but that's really easy to do in, in Photoshop is to take it from being a black and white image and make it into something that the computer thinks is a color image. So it'll start off in grayscale, and then I just have to convert it to red, green, blue. Um, so that uh, I get all the color options. So if I want to add color, basically I can't do it to a black and white photo. So none of the, none of the things will show up if I don't first convert it into a, uh, a color image. And that's not to say that this has any more color than the previous image, but um, it's sort of like the mindset of the program, right? It has to be in, um, it has to think it's a color image, even if there's no color in it in order for you to be able to do anything. Um, one of the tools that they've added to Photoshop, I don't know how recently, <laughs> yeah, it's a conceptual mode, exactly. Um, so it's like, oh, you wanna use the color tools. Well, we better, yeah, computational, yeah. We better give you the, uh, the option to use color tools. Um, so one of the things that I've added very recently to my tool sets, and I think that it's helped a lot. First, let me make my image full size. Um, when I was playing around with the tools is, uh, there's a really simple way to colorize images. Um, if you go into Photoshop and you hit the filter button and you go down to the neural filters, so the neural filters are ones that basically use some sort of artificial intelligence to try to figure out what are you looking at? 
And if you're colorizing old black and white photos of people and places, this is a great tool. Um, if you're colorizing things that are from an SEM, the AI will not be able to recognize that this is a cockanese, for example. And so uh, it will just try to figure out what it thinks you want to do. And sometimes it does a good job of guessing what I want. A lot of times it just makes stuff white with a little bit of color to it. Um, if you just click on the neural, neural tools, and then um, in the list here, one of them is uh, Colorize, and you can uh, just download it. Um, and I had it previously downloaded, but I just updated. So all the things that, um, that uh, I might want to do, um, I guess I got to re-download them. Uh, I also use the Style Transfer tool relatively recently, and um, I haven't used this color transfer because I think it's brand new, but it's actually what I want uh, in a way. So um, these tools are actually really, uh, really interesting. Hey, Cargo Cult. Um, so one of them is this colorize tool, which has been in the tool set for a while. And um, you can just click it and basically try to uh, try to tell it that you want uh, your image to be colorized. And then, like I said, it'll just kind of guess at what your color expectations are. And maybe it does a terrible job and maybe it does a good job. Um, I find usually that because it's bringing it over from a black and white image that it's completely undersaturated. So if you really want to see what the color it's doing things with is, you have to kind of crank it up. Um, I usually now sort of start with this step and I don't want my diatom to look like a, a plum or a bruised piece of an apple or something. So purple and, uh, and light tan are not really a great um, combination, but it adds a lot of texture and it actually makes the image, in my opinion, look very realistic. So I usually start with this as a tool and then, um, and then I just hit okay, right? So. That's I'm not done. Typically, that's not. Uh, why does nobody color images in MS Paint? I don't know, Cargo Cult. Uh, I don't use MS Paint for anything. Um, but uh, if I was looking for a free tool, it probably would not be that. I would just get the um, the light version of uh, of Adobe Lightroom. Um, yeah, so this filter filter tool, this neural filter tool is really cool. It adds a lot of depth to the image and it actually brings back a lot of things into a, um, a look that I feel is a good look for it. Um, I'm going to just grab some uh, image from um, uh, a recent uh, set of things that I've been working on just to show you what I mean by it adds a lot of depth. So um, let's see, I'll just grab this one. Um, this image already has kind of a lot of depth to it. Uh, this is some uh, crypto organic uh, soil stuff. Uh, these are actually some sort of, so trichormus, tri trichornis is some sort of a, um, I think it's a cyanobacteria or something um, that uh, my friend Nicole is, uh, is doing. And um, so you can see this is kind of a, a kind of a cool image. Um, so we'll crop that. We'll switch it over to the you know color mode, and then uh, I'll go into those neural filters, and you can see the sort of like immediate depth that it adds just with that one click. And I've already got pretty decent color on it, right? So I feel like that's a a nice powerful first step. Um, and this isn't you know this isn't done. But, um, but that's a pretty uh, colorful image for like step one. <laughs> it sees it as algae. <laughs> Apparently, uh, it thinks it's something. I don't know what. Uh, but this is actually kind of a nice start, right? Yeah, cyanobacteria. Um, and then you can, you know, once it's a color image, you can go in and tell it you want to play with the color a little bit and do any of the normal... Um, tools that you might want to use. So for example, if you don't think the color is enough on there, you could really ramp up the saturation a lot and or the vibrance. Um, this is sort of like the reds and yellows in the vibrance. 
um, and this is just the pure, um, you know, the intensity of the color uh, for saturation. And um, you can oversaturate things and uh, pretty easily, so you kind of have to be careful with these. Um, sometimes I think, oh, that looks great, and then I come back and look at it, and I'm like, oh, I put a little too much on there. They do, they do look a little bit like caterpillars. Also, hello, Acerella. Um, I should do these. Um, so, okay, let's say we decide that that's, uh, that's good enough for what we're aiming to do. And, um, and this is kind of close to the color combinations that I want. Um, but let's say um, you'd love to play with my images. Um, well, I have a bunch of them, and I've actually been playing with them because we're doing some sort of an art show. Um, these are from, uh, these are actually taken from uh, um, from White Sands National Park. Used to be White Sands National Monument, now it's a national park. And uh, yeah, some sort of an art show. Uh, so uh, my colleague at the University of New Mexico, no, New Mexico State, I don't remember which one it is. Um, She's, uh, she's in New Mexico, let me start with that. And um, it must not be University of New Mexico, it must be a smaller one. Um, so she's uh, collected these samples and then she sent them to me, I put them on the SEM, and then um, we're doing two things with them. One, they're doing a little art show um, at the university to sort of showcase uh, their the art that we've put together. And I've actually done a bunch of these already um, where I colorize them and whatever. And then um, and then it's sort of like a step one, we're doing it on a local scale. And then step two is we're gonna sort of see what we need to do. And we're gonna take that and sort of expand it up to um, a an actual art installation at the White Sands um, National Park. So uh, this art will then be basically ramped up and ultimately put into some sort of a display there. Um, I haven't, I, you know, I'm, I'm only on my side of things. I just make it and then I go, here you go. And then she says, I like it or I don't like it or whatever. She never tells me she doesn't like it actually. But, um, but I think the more interesting ones are ones that I've done more recently. So, um, oh, you've sampled cryptobiotic soil from Mojave and from Hawaiian volcanoes and Las Vegas. Very nice. Okay, so let's say that um, we're relatively happy with this um, and we want to um, kind of play around with the color combinations a little. So let's say I wanted to make this look a little bit more blue, but, um, but I don't wanna make the whole image like blue. So you can, um, you can do this a number of different ways. Um, you can actually just go in and change the hue, right? So if you want it to be more blue instead of red, you can do that pretty easily. This is nice, simple tools for like changing colors, right? You can just come in and, and whirl these things around. Sometimes they make really unrealistic um, patterns, but sometimes you want that. Um, you know, so this basically is um, a little more red than our previous one was. And this one's a little bit more blue than our previous one was. And let's say I wanted to kind of make it blue. Um, and then you can again ramp up the saturation or, or decrease it a little bit. Um, you can also change the lightness pretty easily. I don't usually mess with lightness because it... Oh, you can't see the tool window. Uh, okay, that's actually... Let's see if I can figure out how to make that a possibility. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, let's see, window capture tool. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it'll show every one of them all the time, but I'm glad you pointed it out so at least I can sort of uh, show what I'm doing. I'm just uh, sliding the the hue slider, right? So this way that usually works is sliding around um, these sliders until you're happy with it. And so again, this is where kind of you have to make decisions, right? So the original image was this colors and I just went under um, uh, adjustments for images and uh, to hue, and then you can, you know, make decisions. I'm happier with it being kind of a blue color because I want it to be blue-green, like algae actually is, right? <laughs> yeah, 
you can also um, well, so I just wanted to start with showing how you could like if you're kind of happy with a color combination, you don't want to do anything else. Um, yes, so so you can. This is just the simplest approach. So if you just wanted to to tinker with it, um, I'm actually on the. Uh, so you can see the layer panel. I think um, the background image is here. Oops, hang on. Let me just hit OK. Um, the background image is still here, and. Uh, it's fine if you if you uh, backseat. I don't care. Um, and then the layer that we're using is actually the um, the neural filter layer. So it made its own layer and it did it automatically. So that's the original image and here's where we are, right? So I'm actually modifying the neural layer right now when I'm doing things. Um, and I would always recommend that you work with layers. Um, so there's a little layer layer panel, um, and um, I actually am going to show you that probably you might want even more layers. Um, you need to um, make decisions however you, you think are, are best. If you just want to shift around the colors a little bit though, it, you know, you can do that here. Um, let's say you wanted to make the colors seem like they're a little bit more dynamic across the image. There's a nice way to do that as well. Um, what you would do is um, you can go under the image, uh, sorry, you want to go under image layer, sorry, layer is the next tab over, and you can't see the layer drop down, but you can roll down until you get to one that says new fill layer, and then your options are solid color or gradient, and I think it's showing you the gradient fill right now, and you can pick any of these sort of normal kind of uh, things that you might want to do, and I'll just show you some of those. Um, we'll start with an overlay, and, um, and then we'll just hit OK, and it pops open with a little gradient and you can select all kinds of different gradients. They're up to you. They start with a simple like gray gradient, which we don't necessarily want. Um, but, uh, but let's say we wanted to give it sort of like an iridescent sheen. Um, there's a whole bunch of little iridescent gradients in here. We can make one that's kind of like this um, in, our, in our list. And um, it will show you this as well, I think. Hang on, I need to kind of move this so I can see. Yeah, okay, so it's showing you the... Um, you can actually play with the gradient if you want it to be radial. Um, you can rotate that around to, to an angle that you want. You can scale it up or down as you like. Um, you can change it to an angle reflect, reflected diamond. There's all kinds of options. I'm just going to stick with a linear one for now. Um, and you can also reverse the order of it if you want by clicking this box or dither it. Um, and then there's a bunch of methods down here you can play around with as well. So if I hit OK, what it's going to do is um, it will s slap that gradient on my image. And um, I want the gradient to be on top of the layer that I made. I don't want it to be on top of the, the black background. Um, and then you can play with it um, as you see fit. So if you want to, to darken the image according to the gradient or do a color burn according to the gradient or a linear burn, um, or darken the colors, or lighten screen. Um, there's all kinds of options that you can um, that you can make, and really these are up to you. Um, yeah. Hey, Iwalazi. Um, however, you feel you want to, um, you know, to colorize things. This is a good way to kind of make. So you can sort of see the rainbow pattern that it's brought into the image, and. Um, you can also just modify it. You can see the hues very strongly now if I put it down here, or you can play with the saturation color. There's all kinds of options that you can use. And really, this is like, you know, you can make it as crazy as you want um, if you wanted to see what those things do. Um, what I recommend usually where I start with is just either soft light or an overlay. And then you can also change the opacity. So this is how much of it's sort of showing through. And um, if you want it to all be there, you can uh, set it that way, or you can just put it at a, at a um, percentage. And is that showing? I, should, I always need to peek. So let's say I decide uh, I don't really like this one. You can just go back in and change it um, and change the angle. You can change all the settings so you, you don't have to feel like you're stuck with whatever you, you did. Um, but that's a nice, simple way to add a, a little bit of texture and a bit of um, uh, a, a bit of a, um, 
uh, depth to the color, right, to do that. So, and if you wanted to do like, there's all kinds of options for it. Um, if you'd rather make it like, oh, I want it to be a little bit more like purpley, um, you can do that. And you can see um, the effect of them as you're moving across it. I think if you, um, the bottom ones are a little bit stronger and, um, but you can sort of see the effect of the gradients that we're putting on. And then, um, you know, like if I want to change the angle, like say I want to get rid of this sort of white patch up here and make it a little bit more purple, um, you can do that um, pretty easily. And then um, you can always come back in and decide, oh, I want it to be a little bit stronger, right? So, um, and those are just like first, first blush kind of tools. And you can see how much depth the image now has. Um, let's say one of the things that's bothering you about um, the image is, uh, yes. Um, so I haven't really even played with the brand new tools. I just updated it before we started. But let's say, for example, that you wanted to um, get rid of this purple patch down here because it's annoying. Um, you can actually, oh, hang on, I need to, Um, you can actually just highlight part of it and then it will try to figure out like, what did you select? So the tool that I'm using is this, uh, select object tool and, um, and it basically will try to figure out what you picked and it didn't do a great job. So you have two choices. You can start over and, um, see if it can find it again. And it did a much better job that time. Um, so. Uh, this is a great way to like, okay, this like really annoying purple part down here is not look good. Um, and you want to make an adjustment to just that zone, right? So you can go in, use this object selection. Um, hey, Uncle Bill. And if for some reason you don't like the way that it selected it, there's an option up here for the select mask tools. And um, you can get really uh, crazy detailed um, you can go in and um, and actually paint the mask or add or subtract to the mask. Um, you can play with all these tools over here to feather it a little bit. Um, but these tools are basically ones that allow you to, um, to make that mask bigger or smaller. So if you don't like the way that it's, um, it's mapped out the mask, you can just use these tools, adjust it. Um, add a little bit to it or subtract from it. Um, you can just paint around uh, images until you have the mask the way that you want. And then just hit OK and it'll come back to the, um, to the mask that's here. And let's say um, there's a couple of things that we can do at this point. One thing that we could do is go under layers and we can add a, um, an adjustment layer. So that will add just like a layer um, to our one little area. And um, if we wanted to, we could do like a brightness contrast adjustment layer. And, um, and then we can just set the contrast super high or the brightness super low. And then um, I have the layers in the wrong order again. Sorry. Um, and then you can sort of see the effect of that, right? So I got rid of that bright purple color, but I kept some of the texture. And um, all I did was slide the brightness all the way down and the contrast all the way down. I could turn the contrast all the way up and actually um, make it sort of a black color. And you know, if I'm happy with that, that's good. Then you, you basically have it the way you want. And, uh, and you can see now I don't have that annoying like purpley glare here. I still have a little bit of a purple up in this spot. So if I wanted to also um, come in and do the same thing here, uh, you can come in and, and pull the same trick, right? Um, just come in, tell it you want to add a new fill layer, um, and then uh, adjustment layer, sorry, and then um, a normal OK, turn down the brightness, turn down the con turn up the contrast, and then now I have uh, gotten rid of those sort of annoying patches. And, um, and there we go. So we've got our bright colors. We've got a really pretty um, uh, gradient sort of mapped over top of it uh, to give it a lot of depth. And then um, the, uh, the actual patterns Good that news, are present everyone. that are here um, 
I mean, I think this is a nicely colored image. Like we're basically at a point where we're almost done, right? Um, and I, that was some really easy steps. And, um, and I think that that's uh, one way that you could do it. And I relied pretty heavily on um, the auto color in this case, um, the, the sort of neural tools. And um, I haven't had a chance to play with that transfer color tool, but it's what I really wanted to have, um, which was um, basically a way to transfer color from one picture onto another. And um, I might do another one after I've played with these a little bit, because like I said, it just came out. So I don't have a good sense of exactly how to use it. Um, oh, uh, ping, um, typically for these images that I collect um, are done with the scanning electron microscope. And um, so these aren't a typical uh, a microscope that you would probably buy. Um, but yeah, then the next question is about how much money you want to spend and, um, and what kind of camera you have. Um, but if you wanted to collect, uh, an image like this, um, you know, from a nice microscope, I would recommend you consider, um, getting a really nice camera and then, yeah, maybe hop onto the discord and, and talk about, uh, you know, what kind of microscope you need based on the magnification and, and how much money you have. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation. Um, so uh, I'm really just showing people how I colorize the images here, but um, you can also colorize uh, images from a light microscope just as easily. Um, I just thought I would do the, the, uh, the uh, SEM images because um, this is sort of what I, become known for, I guess. Um, no, 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 you're not hijacking. It's totally cool. Uh, any questions anybody wants to ask, I'm totally fine with. So um, one other thing that I, uh, let's say we were pretty much happy with what's here. Like, I'm not sure I'm totally happy with it, but um, uh, I'm happy enough. So uh, one thing that I would recommend is if you're totally ready to like move forward with it, or maybe you just have some final tweaks you want to play around with the contrast or something, um, you probably want to save it like this um, so that you can monkey around with stuff if there's something that you didn't like and then save a new version of it with the layers flattened. So all I did was basically turn all the layers down to one layer. Um, and so now it's all on one page together. And yeah, well, this I actually, my source file comes from like a different, totally different place. So there's no chance I'm going to like mess up my original file. Um, <laughs> save your source. Yeah. So, um, so then let's say you have this and maybe I just wanted to make some final adjustments to the, the color and, um, and the contrast. Maybe you can just go in and tweak those things. Um, you know, if you feel like it just needs a little bit more contrast to make it look good or a little less contrast to make it good. Um, and then, uh, maybe about a month ago, um, I bought the Topaz tool sets. So there's a whole bunch of Topaz lab, lab tools that you can get and um, for um, editing image quality. And uh, SEMs are very noisy. So one of the things that I do, yeah, Topaz is a really great tool and it actually is built into um, uh, to Photoshop so that you can just come in and go, oh, I want to denoise this image, get rid of some of the noise from it. And, um, and so I can just click that and I think it's set up so you can see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then you can, um, you can see what Topaz is doing to the image and make decisions based on, um, a slider if you'd like. Uh, I find a lot of times for the SEM that, uh, the best adjustments I can make are low light or severe noise. They're not the standard ones. Um, and this image, you can see how it how uh, it changes the the image quality. Like it's um, it's basically uh, getting rid of all the little dots and turning them into blended dots, right? So the image looks a little bit more um, realistic, uh, a little less artsy um, when you when you uh, do that. And then um, you can use the auto settings if you want. 
um, or you can turn off the auto settings and just go like, oh, well, I don't want it to like mess up the, it's taking too much noise out of the picture, right? So you can just play with the slider. Um, and so uh, Topaz is really nice for this. And actually the tool that I use the most for Topaz is not this one. Um, I, I do like the denoise features a lot and I like the sharpen tool. I got all three. I think it was like um, you buy all three for $180 or something. Um, so it's kind of pricey, but um, the tool that I really like is the gigapixel one, which basically takes your image and makes it so that you can multiply the size of it up to six times without basically decreasing the quality. And in some cases, it actually makes my images look better when I do that. Um, so uh, it's a nice tool. And I think it does a, uh, a really neat uh, job with some aspects of it. Um, and you can play around with this however much you want. Um, I just wanted to show it because I've been using it kind of frequently um, to try to make the images look a little bit more realistic. So this is one of the uh, tool sets if you don't like the way that it looks, if you'd rather have that sort of like uh, very strong, sharp edges to things. Um, or you don't mind that there's some noise in the color, um, you don't need to use that. I mean, I don't think we, I just wanted to show it. We don't necessarily need to, to use it. So let's say I decide this is good enough and then I just wanna um, export it and um, you can just send it as a quick PNG or you can uh, dump it out. This came in as a, um, as a TIFF, but I'm probably gonna wanna export it as a JPEG for now. Um, you know, maybe I want to export it as a TIFF if I'm going to keep playing with it or if I'm going to make it bigger or whatever. But since it'll probably just go on to Instagram, um, I'll just go ahead and, uh, and export it like that. And I can dump it to, into my little desktop area where I've been saving these. Um, so that's, uh, that's one example. And uh, I'm going to leave the TIFF alone. Uh, and then we started with this, uh, this diatom image and I just got sidetracked trying to show you some of the other tools and how um, when you don't have a diatom, uh, it, it will uh, do a pretty good job of guessing at things. Um, so uh, this tool that, uh, that I put on this was again, the, um, I used the colorize tool. Hey, Dr. Derp. And um, another cool, cool tool that I really like that I've been using a lot um, recently, I don't want it to colorize on top of our colorizing. It's just decided that's all I want to do for the moment. Uh, let's see. If I get rid of all the neural filters, if it'll actually give me the menu back. No, it's just like straight to the... straight to the colorized menu. Let's open a different diatom for now. One second. Let's look at this thing. Okay, uh, so not a diatom, a dinoflagellate. This is from a recent stream. And I haven't colorized this at all yet. Um, so I'm just going to go through the same steps I usually do. Get rid of this. I'll uh, auto contrast. I will change my mode to red, red, green, blue. And then um, the neuro, neuro filter. So it colorized automatically. I can't get it to like give me the menu. Oh, hang on. It's because I keep following the same step. Um, if you go into the, um, the neural filters menu, I just wanted to show you another tool that I use. Um, I'm waiting for it to load the neural filters. Oh, we'll see you later, Evo. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, sometimes noise. Um, sometimes the noise removal is good, and sometimes it's kind of a pain in the butt. So um, it's having a hard time loading that right now. Um, I like for SEMs. I really like 
to make some decision about how much noise to remove. Um, it looks like maybe I crashed all of, of Photoshop, so which also happens kind of frequently to me. Uh, no, there's no storms right now. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Oh, I see. It's actually asking me to accept or don't accept. That's what it's hanging up on. OK, so um, another tool that I've been using a lot recently is the style transfer tool. And what it tries to do is take some existing art, and then it transfers some of that onto your image. And you can see the, um, the image that I select has like got a lot of bright colors. Like this is a Monet, I think. Um, this is, I don't, I'm not sure what this, this painting is. Um, but what it does is it actually tries to transfer um, both the color and a little bit of the art style onto your image. And I like to use this, and I think that's probably what this color transfer tool is actually. It's Van Gogh, okay. Um, uh, well, I think this is what this color transfer tool will allow you to do, is take a picture, and then it'll take the colors from the picture and stick it on your black and white picture, which is actually what I was trying to use this for. But you can see it actually makes the diatom or the dinoflagellate or whatever it is look a little bit more like artwork. And um, you can turn up the effect of the artwork if you'd like to make it look more or less like the original, um, uh, the original piece. And um, I think sometimes it makes it look a little too artsy. So if I just want the color, I usually turn down the, um, the opacity. And I'll just steal a bit of the color from whatever it is. Um, the nice thing about this tool is you can also use custom tools and you can select your own images and your own paintings. It's from the 36 views of Mount Fuji. All right. Um, and you can select whatever image you want from your computer um, from this menu. And um, so I've been doing that. I've been taking my um, macro photography and, um, and transferring colors from my, my um, macro photography over. And you can also go into these um, images, and especially if it's a custom image, and you can highlight which area of the image you want to steal colors from or styles from. Um, and this is, like I said, trying to steal the actual paint strokes and things. So it makes your image look like, um, it makes your, yeah, like cross-pollination. It makes your, um, your SEM image or whatever you're, you're transferring it onto look a little bit more like a painting. And I kind of like that, uh, that look. And so um, sometimes I'll just um, let it do its thing. And, uh, and then you can just hit OK. And now you've got your uh, automatic coloring in, like we started with the coloration from the other one. And you can do the same thing. You can um, make some adjustments to the contrast, make some adjustments to the, um, to the color and start playing around with layers to, um, to, build, um, to build the image that you want. Um, and like I said, a lot of this is just about like making decisions in terms of what you want to do. Um, one of the things I would say is that um, another tool that I use pretty regularly is um, going into one of these gradient fills as a um, as an overlay or as a light sometimes. And um, uh, this is an example of how that gradient basically just sort of slaps on uh, whatever you do to it. Um, and you can make them pretty dynamic um, pretty quickly. And you can actually go in and edit them. Uh, is it showing you guys that menu? Yes. No, it's not. Uh, let's see if I can force it to show us that one as well. So there's another menu. If you double click on the gradient, there's so many windows that open. Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, I'll just put it over my face so you don't have to look at me. Um, and then uh, this, is a, this is a tool that I use a lot um, when I'm trying to colorize stuff. How to whisper at me. Oh, you'll send me a PDF of all the views. 
uh, or of Pacific, okay. Um, so you can actually go in and play with the gradient. Like this is a really pronounced gradient and um, we put it over top of something that made it look like a painting. Um, but you can actually just slide these around and it will change the, um, the position. So it's actually laying a gradient of colors over the existing sort of black and white image. And um, you can slide them around. You can also slide around the point uh, at where it's, um, it's drawing the gradient, like where's the uh, midpoint for the gradient. And so you can actually put it like way over on one end. Um, for all of these little gradients, you can change the color. So if you wanted to, you could, um, could go in and make it a, a different color um, in the gradient. And I actually do this a lot, uh, not, not making these crazy colors. I'm just showing you what you can do. Um, you can also go in and um, click here and add uh, as many color gradients to the uh, combination as you might like. So if you want to get crazy with it, or if you decide, oh, I don't want that green, uh, I just want to have these pretty colors uh, all next to each other, you can. Um, and I find that uh, you can add as many as you need, right? Um, to try to make the gradients the way that you would like, <laughs> Jolly Ranchers. Um, these gradients are actually do make images look really um, like Art Deco or neon colors or whatever. You can um, move them around in crazy order to make things look um, more pronounced or less pronounced. Um, and I think that they're uh, a nice way of kind of like um, setting the image the way that you want, like as crazy or as not crazy as you want. And as I mentioned, um, you can, let's say I select that. Um, you can also, if you'd rather do it radially, um, if you want to uh, play with those tools or the angled version or the reflected version or whatever, um, those are all options. Um, and uh, if you decide, well, okay, that's, it's good, but it's a little too crazy, you can always come and take the opacity down and, um, and just add it as a light uh, sort of uh, gradient over top of things. And you can also come in and tweak all of these uh, options. So if, you, if I was using overlay, um, you can change it to a soft light if you want, or if you really want it to be crazy, a vivid light or a pin light, um, just go through and kind of take a look at uh, the things that it will do if you change the settings to something else. And you know, maybe you'll find one in there that you just think, oh, that looks really, that kind of appeals to me and, uh, and make your decisions based on that. So, um, you know, all of these things are basically just a filter uh, over the image and, um, you know, you can use it to highlight different aspects of the image as, as you see fit. So, um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can build it to make things look, um, you know, across a range of, of patterns, how you how you think is uh, is best. And actually, um, this pattern that we have, uh, I like while I'm sitting here, I don't really like the blue, right? So I looked and noticed there's a big blotch of blue over there. The rest of it, I kind of like the way it is. Um, so, you know, Let's say you're relatively happy with that. You're done, right? Uh, you colorize it, denoise it, whatever you want. Um, we can come in, play with these settings. We'll just go in and I'll show you what happens when, oh, I need to uh, flatten it first. And then uh, I can take it over to Topaz and uh, we can get rid of that noisiness. Hopefully. Yeah, and so you can see uh, a really good example of it's uh, getting rid of the noise right there, right? So um, particularly useful for SEM images because they're just very noisy. So uh, what we're looking at, Yieldling, is a uh, dinoflagellate from a scanning electron microscope uh, image collection that I did, um, I think it was last Wednesday, about a week ago. Um, I collected some of these. So you can see the effect of denoising though. That's a, a nice, has a nice effect. And then if we just hit apply, it'll dump it over back into uh, Photoshop for us. Yes, Tripos Furca is the name of it. 
Um, so here we go. We started with a black and white image of this thing, and now we've already got a nice colored image um, and relatively few steps. This one, as I said, we used the um, style transfer tool. Um, you can use the colorize tool if you'd like. You can also skip all of those um, options. You don't need to necessarily um, use the, the high-end tools. And um, I, I think they actually add a lot of depth. And so I really like using them. It's usually where I've been starting a lot recently is, uh, is those. And then I just play with colors until I, I decided it sort of like gets my interest and it's not obnoxious. Um, but this is basically, you know, my um, my current sort of plan, how I, I go from a black and white image all the way through the color. Um, in the uh, relatively recent past, I'm going to, uh, to save this. Give me a second. I'm just going to leave it in a TIFF format in case for some reason I want to play around with it later. Um, and then uh, I'm going to show you one other thing that I, you know, before I did any of these fancy tools in Photoshop with the neural filters, which are pretty powerful, they also won't run on my on my laptop. So um, just as a note, uh, you have to have a pretty decent graphics card um, to run a lot of these things. And sometimes my computer, especially when I'm doing the uh, the style transfer, I can hear the um, the graphics card spinning up. Uh, because uh, it will crunch your computer hard. So um, we'll get rid of that, and then we'll just talk a little bit about this. Like, if we just... Um... <laughs> it's not Sylvia, it's me. Uh, and you're right, S usually Sylvia's not up this late. Sometimes she is. Um... Okay, we'll get rid of this colorized layer completely, and I'll also show you some things that you can do if you don't want to go through all... <laughs> if you don't want to go through all of this um, high-end tool sets, a lot of my colorizing, a lot of the stuff that I did in colorizing images, I didn't use any of these tools. So um, like I said, I've only been using these for, I don't know, a couple of months now. Um, and some of these I just was learning today or yesterday or the day before. I've just been playing around with them in Photoshop. I've been mostly doing it in... Um, in Procreate, and I'll just bring the image and bounce it in, and I'll play with the gradients over there, and then I'll dump it back into um, to Lightroom on my iPad. And I just did almost all of my um, uh, image processing stuff has been done on my iPad. So um, it's only recently that I decided I need to use some of these higher end tools because they're fun. Um, but you don't even need any of those. Uh, once you have it in um, in red, green, blue mode, actually a lot of my diatom images were colorized without ever doing any of those steps. Um, I just went in to um, what is the color balance in Photoshop? Is it showing you that? Yeah. Um, and then I would just play with the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. And um, those are the only things I would do. I would just go in and go like, okay, well, I want the highlight to be kind of like a blue color. I want the midtones to be kind of like a greenish color. And I want the shadows to be sort of like a reddish color, right? And then uh, I would just play with these. And um, these are really simple, but they break the image down into the three components and, um, and allow you to adjust different parts of the image to add some color. Um, and then you can make decisions about how you want those things to go. Um, one of the things that uh, it does is makes the image a little dark if you leave on that preserve luminosity thing. Um, but you can see that it's a lot flatter, right? The color choices and options for you are a little bit simpler. And, um, and you can't make as many... Uh, hey, Commander Shepard. Um, and you can't make as many like really great... Uh, decisions about things with just some three color sliders and uh, and uh, and a selection as to which one of these components you wanted to adjust. So this is a sort of a limited way of doing it, but I think that um, like I managed to do it for a long time with just these tools, and then in um, in Lightroom I would use like play with the texture and the clarity, which are two sliders that are in there, and um, and really, that's all. 
Uh, and you can have those tools in even the light version uh, of Adobe Lightroom. Uh, just dump it in, mess with the colors a little bit by playing with the shadows and the midtones and the highlights. And I got really great um, colors out sometimes if you just sit and play with them for a long time and uh, make decisions that uh, you start to sort of see what colors you need to do with which parts um, to, uh, for example, if you wanted to make something that looked like it was gold, you can do it. Like I'm making that like uh, lip around the outside look sort of like it's gold. Um, and it's completely possible to sort of play with those things until they, um, they turn into something that you really like. Um, it's also quite easy to make them look hideous. So just keep that in mind um, that there's options that, that look really terrible. Um, I'm not actually making any layers here. Uh, I'm just playing with shadows, midtones, and highlights. So no layers. Uh, this is just the color balance tool in Photoshop. This is the simplest version of, of what you could do. Um, you know, just sliders, and there's no layers, and it's just the base black and white image, basically, that I'm modifying. Um, and this is, like, for a long time, this is all I did, was just play with these a little bit. And then, uh, and then I started using Procreate, and I feel like my um, my images sort of changed uh, a lot once I started playing with gradients instead of these. Um, but uh, but this was how I did most of my editing. I just played with these three different choices between highlights, midtones, and shadows. So it's actually sort of like a gradient. Um, it's picking what it thinks are the shadows or the darkest uh, of the grayscale. These are the middle colors of the grayscale or tones of the grayscale, and um, the highlights are the bright ones. Um, so you can, you know, you can play with these without having any layers. Uh, you don't need to have any of the high-end tools. And these are sliders that you can get in any graphics program, even the free ones. Um, so, you know, I think it's totally feasible to do this with a low budget. You don't need to be um, necessarily using um, uh, using um, Photoshop and the high-end tools. If you don't have the money to do it and you want to just edit images in, um, in you know, the light version of Lightroom, you can, um, you know, no cost at all, basically, right? And you just do it on your iPad, which is what I do, or on your phone, uh, if, you, if you have the light version of it on your phone. So um, you can make those changes relatively easy without any layers. Um, I actually think the layers are helpful and um, and for me, I really like to play with them a lot. I particularly like to use the either the solid fill color layer or the gradient fill color layer, or I'll choose the adjustment layer and just adjust a part of the image. Um, you know, if if I wanted to, um, you know, just uh, grab some part of the image, like in this case, the the valve of the diatom and colorize it and leaves the rest of it black and white. You can, um, you can do that with the selection tools pretty easily in here. Um, so that's a, um, you know, a way to, uh, to um, separate them without having to go through, you know, uh, a lot of work just using the object selection tool, so. Uh, gradient maps are the same thing as basically a gradient layer, uh, in my opinion. Gradient mapping is what I do when I use Procreate. So you just go under Filter and, or I think it's Image Gradient Map. Um, and it's basically the same as the gradient layer that we were using. You can go in and, and it actually has a lot of the same options. So you can just slap it in there and add as many things as you'd like to it. It's the same as the one we were using. Hey, paleontologizing. Uh, you're, um, you're rating me in a very weird uh, evening stream that I'm doing. Um, people have been asking me, how do I colorize the images that I, um, that I do for SEM work? So um, this is like a art photography stream. And um, not uh, not my normal stream. Normally I'm collecting these images. And I should point out that um, we'll be streaming from the scanning electron microscope tomorrow. And uh, Studio Cornix, who's I think still here um, in the channel, uh, will be on the stream with me. 
and we'll be looking at some samples that she sent me and um and uh she's still here and uh so i think that's her debut on twitch i mean she's been in chats but i don't think she's actually made an appearance before so um Nothing is but uh Not you can you check can out imagine. studios um instagram link there she does some uh art and she's a scientist as well and uh, i do some art and i'm a scientist as well so uh we've got a lot of uh things in common so this will be your debut yeah she said she was gonna brush her hair real good so um i feel like i should brush my hair good so that news, uh, everyone. it's not sticking up crazy like it is right now i had it in a hat all day so it's doing whatever it wants um you had a weirdly late stream, so you hope it, it's worked out. It's working out fine. Um, thank you for bringing a ton of people in. And um, I'm sure that Pacific Plankton gave you a shout out somewhere up there. Or she will. Um, what are diatoms? Diatoms are a type of, uh, of algae. And uh, they make a silicious skeleton, which is what we're looking at right here. A skeleton of it in the SEM. And... Uh, uh, I was just showing off some of the tools that we can use in Photoshop to colorize uh, images. And um, uh, I haven't played with this one yet, but I'm uh, excited about the possibility of what it can do. Um, it's just stealing colors from an image, from any image that you give it. Um, Good news, everyone. You can also, if you don't like that option, you can just use the colorize option, which we've been using. Um, as a starting point and then turn up the saturation. These are like quick and dirty ways to colorize images. And then um, you can also use the style transfer tool, which we've also used as a, uh, a quick and dirty uh, way to colorize images and get rid of that uh, super strong effect of it um, as a way to get some initial color in. And then, um, and then, uh, once you have that, then I was showing basically how you can go through and add layers. Um, we can do a gradient layer. We can do all kinds of uh, fun tools inside of um, uh, Photoshop to alter the image um, however we would like and or not like in some cases um, to, uh, to make it interesting. So if I want to make this look kind of iridescent, I can do that pretty easily. And then um, I can come in and tweak all of these um, these images, uh, parts of the image that we want. So if I feel like uh, I kind of like this crazy color scheme, um, I might go down to that, that layer and, uh, and add a little bit more uh, saturation to it. Uh, not so much that it becomes annoying. And I could change the colors around a little bit, um, you know, if I don't like the particular combination of pastels that we had uh, pretty easily. And then um, uh, my work is uh, mostly as a paleoecologist, a paleontologist, if you'd like. Um, I work on diatoms, and uh, but I also do art. And let's see, this is my Instagram links. They're on the screen somewhere up there. Um, but uh, I sort of bounce around uh, doing art occasionally and photography, and, uh, and I work with diatoms for research. Um, so uh, and it, paleontologizing often raids me when I'm on my light microscope. Actually, my evening streams are usually from either a light microscope or sometimes I'm just pointing my camera at things like a storm or the moon or the sky or birds and, um, and letting them do most of the work. Um, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm actually just running stuff from, uh, from my microscope here at home. And then typically on, uh, in the daytime streams, I'm on my scanning electron microscope and we're collecting images like the one that you're seeing here. So, uh, that's sort of my laundry list of things I do. Occasionally I play games. Occasionally my daughter also does uh, uh, some streams with me draw where she does some drawing. Um, sorry, I see your question about uh, what's the scale. And the answer to that question is probably most easily determined by just going backwards um, until I 
um, have the scale bar on the bottom. So uh, here's the scale bar that's in microns. So that's two microns and the entire width of the page that we're looking at is, uh, is, impossible. is about 13, 14 imagine. microns. So that's like this way and this way across the image. And diatoms are very small. They're dust sized uh, organisms. This is a cochinese, which is a, a type of um, an epiphyte. They live on plants. And uh, this one was collected from San Francisco Bay. So um, just to give you, uh, I, I'm trying to sort of talk about what I'm doing here and also talk about like science at the same time and everything else. Um, let's see, uh, do they resemble algae today? Well, this is a living diatom. Uh, it was collected uh, alive. It's dead now, but uh, it was collected alive. And um, uh, they, I do have some, I do work on fossil stuff as well. I have some diatoms that are like 10 million years old in my lab that, I, um, that I'm working on describing. Um, I've described, I don't know, 12 or something species. And I have a genus that I've erected. Um, as a diatomist, I'm a, a full professor at Indiana State University. So I do a lot of research. And then streaming is sort of like uh, my fun outreach activity. So um, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of streamers uh, here in the channel as well, besides, uh, besides uh, paleontologizing, there's a lot. Um, uh, people ask me a lot of times, like, how do I color his images? And so that's what, uh, that's what the stream was about. And, uh, in particular, um, uh, Sam, Sam Shung, who's here, I think he's still here. Uh, yeah, there he is, um, was asking me, um, how I do this. And, uh, he's a, a regular viewer for my channel and also for Pacific Plankton's and, uh, uh, generously donates subs to the channel and I thought oh I should probably show how I do this a little bit and then uh, I've been also asked a lot on Twitter because I post my pictures to Twitter and Instagram like how do I do this so I thought if I just recorded a, a session where I talked about it a little bit um, people could give it a shot and then I don't have to do that work for them um, they can learn how to do this on their own um, unfortunately it's it's it can be easy but it also can require a lot of sort of tinkering and making decisions and uh, making good decisions um, if you want it to look good. So um, diatoms need a better PR team. Well, uh, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to, to be the PR team. Uh, I feel like I've done a good job of um, highlighting the beauty of diatoms. And then hopefully that gets people interested in, um, in it as well. Uh, and then I can talk about the science of the diatoms. So once I've entrapped them with how gorgeous they look and how amazing they are, then I will uh, slip a little science in, you know, while they're not looking. So uh, they can learn things like diatoms generate a really large fraction of the oxygen that you breathe. Somewhere between one in every three breaths and one in every five breaths is oxygen exclusively from diatoms. Um, and then there are fossil diatoms. They range back actually to the Jurassic or so. So they're about as old as the dinosaurs, um, except for they didn't go extinct when uh, when we hit the KT boundary like uh, dinosaurs did. Um, in fact, they've got stronger. So uh, you were enjoying my lightning stream a few nights ago. Yeah, so I've been uh, streaming a little bit. Sometimes I do like just some night, evening, moon sort of, relaxing laid back sort of chill streams um and and sometimes i do a little bit more like chilled microscope streams so uh where are they on the family tree of life uh Litten gamer diatoms are called they're what's called uh, stromenophiles and um that's probably a word you're not familiar with but effectively they're algae the problem is algae doesn't mean anything um it's a sort of like meaningless term it, it means not plants but making, but having chloroplasts and not cyanobacteria. That's basically what algae is. Um, uh, so like makes chloroplasts and other pigments. And in the case of most algae, they're single celled um, and diatoms are single celled like that. So um, usually uh, if I start with their stromenopause, people don't know what I mean. So I don't bother with that. Um, well, dinosaurs didn't go extinct, or not all of them, right? But uh, we don't know exactly how old 
dino, uh, dino, diatoms are. The most clearly confirmed cases of diatoms are, um, are Jurassic, but um, they may actually be older. And estimates are they didn't just spring up fully formed as diatoms, so they probably go back a little farther than that. But, um, but we don't know what that boundary is for sure yet. And um, there's a lot fewer people looking at ancient diatoms than there are people looking at ancient dinosaurs, as you might expect. And, uh, and they're a little bit harder to, um, to have very long records from because the oceans only go back around 200 million years. Um, and things that lived in the oceans basically get deleted after about 250 million years because the plates subduct and the ocean basically disappears. So there's just little bits of parts of the earth where the ocean stuff lasts longer than that. So, um, that creates problems, right? For us trying to get a, a sense of how old things are. Um, the ocean basins are very young relative to the rest of the crust of the earth. So, um, so that makes a, a limit for us to know what was going on back there. Yeah, it deletes the crust, it subducts it. And, uh, and if you look at the oldest places in the ocean, they're, I think 250 million is as old as they get. So um, you have to get into these really weird conditions where the bottom of the ocean gets preserved on the surface of the land, which is pretty unusual. So, sometimes cyanobacteria. Yeah, they, they're called blue-green algae in the old days when people didn't realize that they were actually bacteria. Um, and then there's sort of like a history of cyanobacteria being called algae, even though they're bacteria. So. Um, uh, algae in general are a much higher percentage, um, at least half are, um, are algae, maybe more. Um, but diatoms aren't all the algae. There's other algae and other organisms that are responsible for oxygen. So, uh, the estimates are kind of all over the place. It's like people use the back of a napkin to figure out some of these values. They realized it was a very high number, but they don't really know exactly what the number is. Um, were diatoms responsible for the great oxygenation event? No, I don't think they're that old. I think that's all cyanobacteria um, that was responsible for the GOE. Um, the earliest organisms um, that we have records for that photosynthesized were things like stromatolites and, um, and other types of cyanobacteria. And um, so it was definitely a cyanobacteria that did did most of that heavy lifting that got the initial atmosphere to be a little bit more oxygen rich, and then at that time actually we didn't have uh, we didn't have an ozone layer really, and we didn't have a um, uh, oxygen was toxic to most organisms, so not a lot of organisms could actually breathe oxygen back then. Um, in fact, I don't think any of them did initially, so uh, it. It took a while for organisms to adjust to breathing oxygen um, because we didn't have an atmosphere that had oxygen when you go back to three billion years ago. So, um, are diatoms better pets for children than pterosaurs? Yes. Uh, yes and no. Um, fall machine, I think the problem is that you can't really pet a diatom. I mean, you could pet a colony of diatoms maybe um, because they're dust sized particles, so it'd be like petting your hand. But um, so in the sense that uh, you'd get some sort of response from the organism that you might be happy with, probably, probably they're better for you than a pterosaur. I feel like a pterosaur might bite you um, and that could be bad. Um, do you suspect the first diatoms were marine? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, that's what everybody suspects that um, diatoms evolved first in the oceans and then they what we call invaded the land many times. In fact, there's evidence that they um, transferred from the oceans to the land surface in many different um, pulses. And um, most of the earliest terrestrial diatoms that we have evidence for go back to about the Eocene and not much earlier than that. Um, and they looked pretty different than modern uh, terrestrial diatoms. So. Uh, let's see. 
everybody stay on my good side or diatom's good side i don't think they have a bad side um they're clones and um they're really good at just absorbing nutrients so it's kind of hard to um to get on their bad side so uh your favorite diatom is candy corn okay uh yeah if you get to really small versions of uh of diatoms that where the shells, the the um, valves are broken, they can be very sharp. Um, pterosaurs could be petted, kind of like cats. Well, then I guess maybe pterosaur might be a better pet. Don't pet the diatomaceous earth. It'll dry your hands out, I'm told. Um, uh, there's some really cool things about diatoms and what happened to them when they took over in the um, in the marine realm. Um, I think I've mentioned this before to you, Danny, that um, when diatoms evolved, they're, they, be, they were so prolific and so capable of um, absorbing nutrients that they shifted the balance of um, silica in the oceans. So the concentration of silica in the oceans used to be much higher. And you can tell this because the, um, the sponges the silica flagellates and everything else that basically had a silica skeleton, like the radiolarians that had already evolved, uh, started making lighter and lighter skeletons. And it happened right after diatoms basically showed up. And so you can see this like transference of as diatoms started to radiate and become much more prolific and, um, and productive that they basically sucked all of the silica out of the oceans. And all of those other organisms on planet Earth basically had to, to adjust to the fact that diatoms came in and kicked everybody's butt when it came to replication. Good news, everyone. And um, uh, you can actually literally see it in the fossil record. Like everything shifts towards lighter skeletons because they, um, the oceans became completely depleted with respect to silica. And um, uh, I, I think that's... Um, uh, kind of one of the neat things about diatoms is that the as long as there's silica present, they usually outcompete everything else, and um, and destroy uh, everything else. So <laughs> clones are always trustworthy. Uh, well, you know some of the stormtroopers defected in some of the recent Star Wars movies, so they're not all bad. Um, but diatoms aren't always clones. They're almost always clones. They clone and clone and clone and clone and clone. And then periodically there's a little broken wheel pattern where they switch to sexual reproduction. So they've got a really strange sexual reproduction cycle um, where they start off very large. And then every time they replicate, they get smaller and smaller. And then they get to a certain size fraction. And then an environmental cue causes them to switch to sexual reproduction. And they switch from being clones to um, mitosis, to, uh, sorry, meiosis. Um, and will switch to, um, to having sex. So uh, because they replicate so quickly, sometimes those, uh, those sexual cycles occur every um, year for some of them. Like they go through the whole size series down to something reasonable and get an environmental cue every year. But more typically, I think it's like three to five years. Um, where most of them sort of will switch to sex and then like everything in the water column switches to sex at the same time that's in the same species. So, um, <laughs> yes, Silicon Valley should probably not anger the diatoms. I really don't think that diatoms get angry, but um, let's see. Uh, would you say that's when diatoms attacked? Um, you know, it's really funny. I... Uh, I came up with this name diatoms attack back when I was just learning about diatoms and uh, I hadn't become a diatomist yet and it was like 1998. Um, it was before I had even decided I was going to study diatoms and uh, my friend was uh, uh, working with us in Florida Bay and I was at the time working as a, uh, I, was, I had my master's degree but I hadn't gone on for my PhD yet. And um, uh, my friend, uh, she had a really great sense of humor, and we were talking about diatoms being like vicious and attacking. And uh, and I said this would be a great name for a band, you know, diatoms attack formation. Like this idea that uh, you take this completely benevolent thing, 
and then make it seem like a monster from you know like 50 foot tall diatom destroying uh, a city and then uh, and I remembered that for the longest time and um, and then when I started to uh, when I joined Twitter and I wanted to come up with a cool handle I was like oh I'm gonna use diatom's attack formation and uh, it's too long uh, the word formation would not fit in there, so I had to just switch it to Diatom's attack, and um, uh, and that's what I went with. And then I started Twitch about a year ago, and I just carried that name with me, and so I've just been using that as my sort of like moniker since then. But um, uh, recently, I went and uh, googled Diatom's attack because I thought, oh, I wonder like if people have used this phrase before. And so like not the name, not my name, but like diatoms attack, like two separate words. And, um, and I found an article from like 2012-ish um, where they talked about, like some journalist made a joke about diatoms attacking. And I was like, uh, somebody else had the same idea as me, uh, that you have this completely like benevolent thing. And, uh, and so it looks like maybe I cribbed their notes, but I didn't, I actually had it long before them. So, I, I mean, way back in the, before I knew really what diatoms were. So, um, but yeah, that's the story. And um, so sometimes people ask me, like, what about diatoms attacking? And I'm like, they don't attack. Actually, I had a really funny um, interaction with a, a person. I don't know who they were. Um, I made some comment about diatoms attacking on my Instagram page. And then they proceeded to say, like, you can't, you can't just say things like diatoms are attacking. Um, because people will, will, you know, so they gave me like a lecture about how I couldn't use that phrase. And I was like, it, it's just my name. Like, it's, it's a joke. Um, but they thought maybe that diatoms were creating some nasty, you know, poisonous thing. And I was like, the diatoms don't, well, there's a few diatoms that create poisons or toxins, but, um, but they're all in the marine realm. And I mostly work in freshwater realm, even though we're looking at a marine diatom right now. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's because I'm a scientist and they, they were all worked up about how I shouldn't be saying things like that. And I was just like, you know, people, uh, people always want to give you a lecture and, uh, and tell you how to live your life. So, you know, I just uh, told them to shut up and, and then I deleted their message. Um, and then I do what I want. I don't need to take any advice from strangers. Uh, here's another diatom that I have just laying around I need to work on. Um, you know, if it was my mom telling me I should be nice and not do it, I would be like, okay, mom. But like a total stranger, nah. Uh, they don't get to tell me what to do. Um, not anytime soon, anyway. I mean, they can try. I do what I want, though. All right, let's let's uh, let's play with some of these style transfer tools. We'll just slap on a, a Monet on top of this. Oh, that's rough. I forgot to change it into a color image first. Step two, turn it into a color image. Step three, neural filters. And then, uh, boom, that's what I was trying to do. Look at the color it added. I'm like the laziest uh, artist ever right there. I hardly did anything. I just pushed a button. Um, I wanted to actually go through the menu though. Um, style transfer. And then I could get rid of this ridiculous fuzziness. So it's trying to make it look like it's a Monet. It's like, turn the strength up or down, turn the opacity up or down, play with the details. Uh, or turn that off and just cheat and do the colorize button and then boom, there you go. Uh, easy, easy peasy. The, uh, am I satisfied? Not really, but we'll take it for now. Oh, let's put that back. I thought I was grabbing this menu. Okay. Uh, pseudo Nitsia, Yeah. Those guys. You heard there were diatoms in the vaccines. I'm sure there were. Uh, I'm sure 
the uh, <laughs> yes, they well actually my name exactly. Uh, I'm sure there were diatoms in the vaccines. They saved us many many times. Scientists are not allowed to have fun. I'm sorry, uh, all I do is have fun. Um, even when I'm working, for the most part, my uh, my work is fun. So. Uh, what you have to do is just uh, invest an extra six years in schooling, uh, work hard every single day, um, you know, break your back working like, I don't know, 60, 70 hours a week for the first four or five years. And, uh, and then things get easy. And, and then your life is just fun from that point forward, I guess. You just stream when you want, publish papers when you want, whatever. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah odontella it does look a little bit like a ravioli um it's funny uh you would mention ravioli uh paleontologizing because um every time i teach a diatom taxonomy class the first thing that we do is um we classify the pasta into genera so like i Tell them to treat pasta like they're different genera and they have to erect a genus and they have to classify the pasta into the genera that they erect and um it's a like a you know like a philosophical task to try to get them to learn to think about um what characteristics should you use to um, to classify things and um and it's almost always pasta and everybody always gives me this crazy look like you want me to put pasta into genera uh and then i explain it and then they do it and they do a great job uh you know thinking through what kind of features are the important ones and and what aspects of the structure of pasta are important um uh and i actually uh posted this novelty dinosaur pasta uh actually posted this about doing this on Twitter um, earlier this year when, when my class did it this time. And I showed one of my students actually built a, um, a cladiogram where they had broken out the families into the actual like uh, cladistic groups they belong in and showed which characters were lost and gained. It was actually hilarious. And, um, and then I got all these people who do taxonomy that wanted to borrow that uh, assignment and they were like, this is a great idea. Um, and uh, Let's see, we also did cereal one year. And um, and I keep threatening to do candy, but I never never managed to do it. So, <laughs> um, But it's a good thought experiment. So uh, this one looks like a sushi wrap. OK. The real reason people became scientists is to get to do grant writing all day. I almost never do grant writing. Um, I write papers. My grant writing is uh, most of my colleagues just write the grants and then they include me because uh, they want someone to analyze the diatoms and do a good job. At one time, I got a cladistics friend to run some trees to determine if hot dogs are sandwiches. Well, what about tacos? I think as long as we're like throwing out uh, uh, a fight, starting a fight. Um, so yeah, the uh, the um, the grant writing usually happens. Somebody else does all that. Uh, grant writing is terribly painful, by the way. Um, here's another diatom image that I collected recently. This is Melosyra, and um, we found this in the marine realm, but that's not a marine diatom. Uh, it's just been carried down the river. Um, Melosyra do occur in the oceans, but this is, I think, Melosyra variens, which is a freshwater diatom. And uh, we did find it in, uh, in the um, San Francisco Bay. But when it rains, you know, stuff gets carried into the bay. So can we sequence hot dogs? <laughs> Um, I mean, you can, I don't think it's going to be a good idea, but you can, uh, I feel like it's going to be pretty messy. There's going to be a lot of mix of things associated with that. 
Um, let's see, we'll add a gradient layer. We'll just play with the gradients a little bit as long as we have a bunch of people in here and we're having fun chatting. Um, I don't want that, uh, that's not that's not the gradient. Uh, that's not the gradient I was looking for. Uh, let's go with something orange. That's a, that's a little much. Uh, but we'll start with this, right? We'll just start with it. And uh, we'll just play with some things. Oh, it doesn't look good backwards. And then, uh, and then we'll play with this tool as well. Ooh, that's kind of cool. I want something that highlights the character on the uh, on the valve face. Like that's too bright. That's uh, that's in the realm of ridiculousness right there. You can really see the details, but uh, it looks like it's glowing. That's a crazy image. That one also is kind of crazy. Uh, let's see. Eh. Eh. Let's go with, uh, what was this one that we liked up here? Yeah. Linear burn. And then what I'll do is I'll just turn the opacity down. Uh, not that far. There. It's a little dark now, um, which is like a problem, right? Uh, so we can, um, make an adjustment through... Uh, a layer if we wanted to. Turn up the brightness a bit and the contrast. So I'm just using uh, using a layer to um, to make it brighter. That's not bad. Um, a little monotonous, just two colors, right? So we could make some adjustments to that uh, eventually, um, just as a as an example. I keep grabbing the wrong chat window. I want I want that to go back over here. Ah, and I want the uh, the one that's hiding back here. Okay. Candy corn. Yeah, it's very candy corn like. <laughs> um, everything in the universe is either a diatom or not a diatom. This is true. Food analogies are great when you're hungry. That's also true. Uh, I'm hungry frequently. Uh, stay hungry, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, let's see. You would just color everything green. Um, this is actually a problem that I have. It sounds like a silly thing to say, but um, uh, if you look at my Instagram panel, a lot of times I look at like the uh, most recent colors that I've used, and I try to like pick something that's a different color so that I don't end up just doing everything green. Because um, that that uh, uh, I think that. I feel like it's a little too stagnant for people. Uh, I want to try to like, uh, you know, touch them. I feel like if everything was green, if they like green, that's gonna work. Um, how does nature produce something so elegant? That's a great question. Um, you know, over time, evolution. So yeah, millions of years of evolution, exactly. Uh, it's not your fault. It does look like, uh, it does look like candy corn. I'm totally happy with that uh, statement. Um, don't let the creationists see the stream. They'll say diatoms aren't real. They're all photoshopped. I already have uh, freckled science come in and tell everybody that diatoms don't really look like this. And she acts like I was pretending they did. Um, but I haven't actually edited the photo in any way other than add color to it. So, and, uh, you know, the diatom is still there if I if I hide the uh, the overlays. So... Uh, I feel like they can say whatever they want. Um, I, I don't care about creationists, to be honest. They can, you know, have their opinions, I guess. Um, do any of the diatoms fluoresce under UV or other bands? Uh, 
I doubt it. But, um, I mean, no more than any other thing with pigments. Uh, but I don't usually look at the um, pigmented cells, so maybe Studio would have a better answer to that question. Um, I generally just get rid of all of the... Uh, step one is get rid of all the living stuff so I can look at the, the skeleton. Um, let's see. <laughs> it does look a little bit like a marshmallow. Uh, it looks like a piping hot piece of barbecue coal right at the points where you can throw your steaks on it to cook. Wow, Medea, you are really hungry. Um, I think maybe you need your dinner. Um, yeah, they, they say whatever they want. They can and they do. So, I mean, uh, it, how many times do you got to argue with people about how an eye forms, right? Uh, <laughs> Oh, oh, they'll think that all of the dinosaurs have just been 3D printed. Is that, uh, is that what you're thinking, Fall Machine? Um, good recipes are worth the effort, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they have a very light peer review process. <laughs> exactly. Uh, these types of allergies have A, B, C, and carotenoid. And they also have uh, fucoxanthin, right? And diatoxanthin. They have these uh, pigments that are diatom special. Oh, Rhino Lion! Hey, Rhino Lion! Hey, if uh, if you're not following uh, Rhino Lion, uh, wait, R H Y N O. Look at that, huh? Um, uh, if you like relaxing pottery streams with a really calm chill environment and uh, he just he does great work and uh, he just he just sits there so patiently and like trims off all of the clay and shapes it perfectly and then uh, he's got such a like a warm friendly community um, if if you're into that if you like um, laid back uh, really calm streams um, you should check out rhino lion uh, I'm not just uh, saying that. I feel like um, uh, I I spend time in his channel when I'm not streaming, like uh, Pacific Plankton here, right? Um, I spend time in her channel and uh, and paleontologizing. Uh, I spend time in their channel when I'm not streaming, and it's it's nighttime and I just want to hang out and see what people are up to. Um, these are people like you should check out their streams. I really just sit, sit there and hang out in their streams because I find them to be uh, quality streamers. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of times you come into a channel and people are like, oh yeah, so and so, and they give them a shout out. Um, and then you, you know, like you know they stream, you want to support them, but like you're not really spending a lot of your time in their channel. Uh, but I actually spend time in these people's channels. They'll tell you, they see me in there. Um, and, uh, and I think they do great stuff. So, um, let's see. Uh, and also, uh, Rhino Lions, uh, he's always, uh, he's up here roughly this time of night and, uh, comes crashing in on Pacific Plankton quite frequently. So yeah, you got your own shout out command. That's how I roll around here. Uh, people who come in with big raids get their own shout out commands and people who come in with small raids sometimes too <laughs> I keep you honest about micro fossils well somebody has to uh, you'll just be out there talking about big stuff all the time otherwise um, so uh, oh you've got bubbles rhino rhino lion has bubbles you have bubble emotes that's cool Most of them extract as murky brown or gold gold brown color. Yeah, I like to call that orange studio. The diatoms are orange diatoms because I like orange. But uh, it is sort of a brownie gold orange. So uh, oh, there's stuff bouncing across the stream. Um, 
let's see. Sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling around in chat and talking and then periodically showing people some stuff on the the uh, the stream here. Um, you're eating lunch as we speak. Um, I'm kind of hungry now, actually. It's been a while since I ate dinner. It's almost one in the morning here. Um, and uh, I don't have to get up too early tomorrow, so uh, so I'm just kind of hanging out on Twitch. Um, I've got a meeting with Nicole, who's the um, the uh, cryptobiotic soil lady, and we're going to talk about some of the images for the for the art show that I'm doing. I guess uh, contributing stuff too, and then uh, and then. I'm going to run into school after that, and Studio Cornix is coming to uh, to be in my uh, my stream, my SEM stream. So she's here in the channel, and um, yeah, yeah, I've seen his bubble machine. I've seen that. Uh, it's not really orange. Well, it's orange-ish, or orange-ish brown. Brown is just orange with some black in it, right? Um, Oh, I guess uh, Pacific Plankton already sent out a chat for you. Uh, uh, what did I miss? Something about... Why would there be anything bad about using color to help better see detail in a diathom? Oh, um, uh, I sometimes have had people give me like a critique. Like, I'd rather just look at the black and white images. You know, why are you posting diatoms with all this color? And um, there is a reason for it, um, which is that uh, I like black and white, but I feel like the color actually speaks to people a little bit differently and um, captures their imagination. It's science art, right? It's sci art. It's not, uh, if I wanted to see black and white images of diatoms, I'd go to the scientific li literature, right? Um, and I see them all the time there, or I just look at my SEM. Um, the colorizing part is like, trying to captivate people and uh, and get them to see the detail and get them to think about the the organisms and and uh, and I feel like that's really important uh, to try to get people engaged and ask questions like what is a diatom or what are these cool things or you know uh, to see those details of the ultra structure I think is kind of important so um, all right uh, Sam uh, thanks for hanging out with us as always and um, I'll have to watch the VOD tomorrow since I've been lost after step one. Crop. <laughs> well, uh, Sam, if you want, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time in the Discord and I'll walk you through it. Um, I'll go over the steps again because I just flip around in the menus um, because I know where they are. But if you wanted to build something and, uh, and I can just walk you through it, uh, that'll be fine. Um, I just realized that I'd planned on streaming tonight, but I got enthralled by my stream. Well, uh, sorry, I guess. Not sorry. Um, uh, do you need cryptobiotic soil to grow Sasquatches and, oh, that's a good question, and Loch Ness Monsters? Um, that's a great question, Danny. I think that, um, I don't know how they're grown. Uh, if I knew the secret to how you could grow a uh, Bigfoot, we'd have a lot more of them. But, um, uh, you know, those Western soils, they, uh, they're, they're mysteries to people, I guess. Um, Sasquatches are not in the same biome as cryptobiotic soils. Um, are there any cryptids that live in, like, the Southwest? Yes, Chupacabra. So you should just use chupacabra as your uh, as your example. That's probably how you grow a chupacabra. So, yeah, there you go, studio. Um, because that would uh, that would probably grow in a, a cryptobiotic soil. So, <laughs> if I want to look at diatoms, I'll look at them with my own eyes at one time scale. <laughs> um, Color helps you see details you can't normally see in black and white. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, um, that I think colorizing the images does is, like I said, it adds a lot of depth. And um, the tools that we use um, allow me to kind of like um, 
add some some depth to the images uh, in a way that um, that I normally people wouldn't wouldn't quite see those details or maybe not as easily. Um, and then also, I just think it's fun. Um, it's it's a way for me to do a little bit of art. Um, I like photography, so for me, it's like uh, just an expression of of what I'm doing and um, a, a way to kind of have an outlet, a creative outlet as a scientist, um, which is, you know, sometimes a challenge. So um, Steve, oh, thank you for hanging out uh, for the whole session. I didn't realize you'd been here the whole time. Um, I'm looking forward to those uh, the samples that you're going to send me hopefully sometime soon here, Steve. Um, thanks for for chilling, hanging out with us. Um, uh, Moosey Fate says, is that a living diatom? Well, it's dead now uh, because it's been in the scanning electron microscope and it's been through uh, news, nitric everyone. acid. But uh, are you asking me, is Melocyribarians, which is what this species is, uh, an extant species? Yes, uh, it definitely is. Um, it's found in rivers all over the United States. So um, that's, a, that's a yes. Uh, but the specimen that you're looking at is dead uh, because it's just the skeleton. Uh, once it goes into the SEM, that's the end of it. And actually a little before then, uh, that's the end of it. So um, it's a diatom that Pacific Plankton sent to me. Oh, I should probably point that out. So this is collected from San Francisco Bay by Pacific Plankton. And then she spends her hard earned money to send me samples so that I can put them in the scanning electron microscope and then share them with people. Um, so oftentimes on my Instagram and my Twitter pages, I will tag the person who sent me the sample. Um, and the samples that we have for tomorrow will be coming from Studio Cornix, who's coming to, uh, to the chat, and maybe even Pacific Plankton, if she can. Um, we'll be in the SCM stream tomorrow, which will start at noon Eastern time, um, around there. And uh, we'll be looking at some material from June Lake, um, which is a lake in California that I've done a bunch of research in. But these are samples that um, that Studio sent me last week. And then we'll also, I think we'll be looking at some of the um, uh, unprocessed material that Pacific Plankton sent me um, from San Francisco Bay. So we just wash out the clay and the salts, basically, and then we'll just slap them right on there. Um, are there any living ancestors of diatoms? Well, we don't know exactly what the ancestors of diatoms are, um, but they think that they arose from, um, uh, I'm trying to think what the, they're in this sort of group of things. I think that they, um, that they think they arose from um, like a cyst. They started off as like a cyst form of another organism. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of what it is that it was a cyst for. Something in the marine realm. Um, but I don't think those organisms are around anymore. So uh, if I want samples, you'd be happy to get me some from around there. OK. Um, you can always send me samples. Um, you know, I'm in Indiana. Um, oh, if you, you can get me some diatoms from Oakland's uh, Lake Merritt. Sure. Um, I'll just take some samples and then we'll at least take a look at them and see what's in them. Um, you know, maybe we'll stumble across something exciting. So uh, it's always worth a while to, worthwhile to take a look at them. Um, or maybe you can just uh, hand them off to Pacific Plankton and then she could ship them with her shipment. Since you guys are both in San Francisco. Uh, okay. Um, see, she was already out there. Uh, she's been uh, streaming in the afternoon today. Uh, Pacific Plankton was streaming from Super Good Labs. Uh, so that was kind of fun into Twitch um, and also simultaneously into Zoom. So, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> Merit is the lake of a thousand smells. Is that a uh, is that a, a a logo for a a lake that you want? Um, I guess it's better than like 
two really bad smells. Um, we've been staining microscope slides forever while examining the markings on birds for other animals using UV. How would this be any different? Uh, oh, that's true. You're right. Um, we stain uh, living cells that go into the microscope. We stain uh, minerals that go into the microscope. Um, I mean, the only difference is I'm doing it for art, right? Uh, whereas people sometimes um, are do those tasks are largely done for science so that you can see the, the color, right? Um, no, 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 no. Uh, Musi fate assist like uh, assist like state insisting. So um, yeah, like a, a state they go in to protect themselves, as Studio says down there. So um, they uh, uh, insisting. I'm trying to think of a way to do way to express it. It's like they have a, a safe room and they build themselves a little safe room and they climb into it, and then they wait for conditions to get better. And then they come, they come out. Um, so it's like a temporary, it's not hibernation because they don't have metabolism, but, um, but it's like that, like a hibernation state, a very tiny safe room, <laughs> physiological happy place. Exactly. Um, right. So yeah, uh, I'm in Indiana, which is Eastern time actually uh where i am so i'm i'm in the eastern time zone um but uh i could come out of my house and uh, and go for a run and end up in central time so if i ran for you know eight miles um that'd be a long run for me but i could do it um i might need to break i need to stop and eat something too they make little hard shells crawl in. Uh, yeah, testate amoebas. Actually, I have some pictures of testate amoebas um, from the SEM. Uh, if you give me a second. Um, let's see. When Pacific Plankton came to visit me a couple of weeks ago, we looked at some testate amoebas. And, um, and I have some. And I can just drop them right into the... Uh, the uh, here we go. Dropped it right into the Photoshop for us. Uh, I still haven't edited this photo, by the way. This is another image I need to work on. Um, mode, color, and then I'm going to hit the contrast button, and then we'll we'll do what I've been doing. We'll just use the neuro filters, and uh, I'll just colorize these, and they'll they'll throw its color onto it. So now you're looking at a color image and then I'm going to crank the saturation up so they look really pink. There, pinkish red. There you go. That was the easiest, cheapest, dirtiest uh, colorizing I could do. But these are the um, the tests, the, the uh, agglutinated tests. They're made out of little tiny silt particles of a testate amoeba. And um, I zoomed in a little too far there. Got a little crazy with the zooming. Actually, I didn't want to drag that. Um, I want to use these little devices down here. Um, you can see this is uh, the, uh, the test for a test date amoeba. And you can also see that they have a little opening. So not visible on the other two, or at least not clearly visible. Um, but there's a little zigzaggy opening right here that the, the test date amoeba lives in. And uh, this is from... Uh, a lake filled with demon's blood uh, where we collected um, some plankton while Pacific was here. And uh, it also was full of uh, testate amoeba floating in the water. So, uh, okay, let's, uh, what did I, I missed something here. So I'm gonna come back into the chat, take a look. Um, Desiccated state of tardigrades is pretty similar. That's a ton state. Um, you're cleaning up. Uh, thank you for uh, the raid, Rhino Lion, and uh, and for bringing people in. Our cella are very pretty. Yes, this is uh, uh, the name for testate amoeba as a group, um, the Arcella. And um, uh, some of my favorite things to look at on the um, on the light microscope. 
I don't have very many examples from the SAM, just these ones. But, uh... <laughs> Can I fill the screen? <laughs> <laughs> you're comfortable zooming into the pixel level, but maybe not everybody else. Yeah, it's a, uh, we went to one of the best places. Uh, it was actually the place where Pacific had her uh, bed and breakfast area. So um, yeah, we can, uh, we can zoom in. There's one uh, set of three test data amoeba that we saw on the scanning electron microscope together. And then um, somewhere I have another picture of one. Oh, you can look right down the, right into the inside of this one. Um, there's a, a test data amoeba where you can see down into the, uh, the middle of it. And, um, let me do something here. So, oh, we got too close, too close. Um, this is we're looking right inside of the testate amoeba's uh, skeleton. This is where the testate amoeba would, you know, like parts of the little pseudopod would stick out here. Um, and what you can see is um, this testate amoeba has decorated the inside of its house with diatoms. That's a diatom skeleton right there. It's actually a chain of diatoms in the group. I'm going to say Pseudostara syra, uh, or maybe Starosyra. And uh, you can see um, right here and a chain of them going back into the inside of the chamber um, where it, um, it uh, just stuck the body of its dead victims on the inside as artwork. Um, pretty cool. Um, the, that uh, they often, so they create their skeletons in a process that we call agglutination, which is just means gluing things to them, their skeleton. And, um, and this one has uh, agglutinated diatoms onto its skeleton and, uh, like tintinids and other things. Um, they, uh, they basically make their house out of whatever's available, sort of like caddis flies. If you know what a caddis fly is, um, whatever's in their environment, they make as part of their, um, uh, as part of their their home, their nest, or their or their uh, their test in this case, um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> interior designer. Sometimes they have this the diatoms on the outside as well. Um, <laughs> is is it artwork or is it more like when dishes pile up? Uh, I think what happens is when the test state amoebas finish eating stuff, they just barf it back out the hole it came in. So, um, uh, if it, if it's dishes piling up, it's because, uh, they were in the, uh, amoeba's belly when we, when we killed it potentially, but I'm guessing that's not the case. So, all right. Um, yeah, it's like one o'clock in the morning. And uh, I feel like I did an okay job of showing people the tools um, that I use to colorize images. Um, there's the quick and dirty tool, uh, just using the colorize switch. Um, there's the um, a slightly less quick and dirty tool of um, transferring color or transferring uh, style onto an image. Um, there's the, uh, the approach of, of um, highlighting things like um, selecting objects. So, oops, um, selecting an object like this, right? Using the selection tool to automatically detect a boundary for an object. And then we can colorize uh, the object itself after we modify the mask. Um, and then uh, using layers, we can add uh, color, solid colors or gradients. And we can also do things like make adjustments to brightness and exposure and that sort of thing. Um, and then really simply just using the adjustment tools to, um, to change the hue and saturation and the color balance, um, to try to get the image to, to get into the color ranges that, that you want. Um, and those are the main tools that I use to colorize and, um, I suspect I make it look kind of easy um, because I've been doing it and I do it frequently. But um, if you have Photoshop 
and you get familiar with those tools, I feel like it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You just need to play with it and you just need to tinker around with the colors and um, hopefully whatever you're making doesn't look hideous. Um, and uh, for me, it's like I said, it's a fun outlet. So um, Dr. Derp, thank you for, for hanging out and Moosey Fate and uh, Pacific Plankton, of course, and Studio Cormix. Uh, Studio will be with me uh, in the, uh, the Discord chatting and on our stream tomorrow. And um, maybe Pacific Plankton will also be there. I'm not sure what her plan is. Um, and we should probably end the stream by, uh, by attacking somebody. Uh, we've got to find a person to attack, that means. And it's kind of late, so good luck, I guess, for me trying to find a, a person to, to raid. Oh, I have a couple of people I can choose, which is great. Um, we have uh, Freckled Science. We have Asymmetric Soul, who's a musician. And um, uh, some people playing games outside of that. So I think probably we either want to go with uh, Asymmetric uh, playing some music or Freckled Science doing some, uh, she's probably 3D printing some things, which she's been doing, right? Looks like that's what she might be doing. Um, we could also go raid Sand Experiment um, if you wanted something that was a little bit more artsy. Those are those are all some good options. Um, you're trying to be there. Freckled, yeah. Freckled would be fine. Um, let's see. Wait, you're thanking Pacific Plankton for the stream. Did you mean earlier today? Um, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, oh, you vote for sand. Um, okay. Uh, Anna just started in doing something special for Inktober. Is Anna sand? Is that sand experiment? Who's Anna? We'll, we'll do whatever you want, uh, uh, Bill. You just got to tell me. Okay, yeah. so that's Sand Experiment. Okay, we'll give Sand Experiment uh, a raid. I'm not on a first name basis with her, so. Um, but I think that would be a good transition. We've got a lot of artsy stuff going on. Um, we will go raid in art. And thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And um, I'll keep the VOD up. And so if you're really interested, you can go back and rewatch it. Um, or you can always ask questions or you can drop in at my Discord and uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it again probably when I figure out the color transfer tools a little bit. Um, uh, I want to thank all the great raids that we got from Rhino Lion and from, uh, from Paleontologizing, bringing your hordes of people in. And, um, um, and we'll go give uh, Sand Experiment a raid. She, she comes on kind of late at night. Uh, and I think would be a good place to, to take all of our artsy people. And um, if you're going to bed, have good dreams. And we'll see you tomorrow, maybe around noon Eastern time for the SEM stream. And um, if not, maybe we'll catch you sometime later in the week. Also, I should point out for people, um, I'm not streaming on Saturday again this week. Um, last week I went to go see Dune. And this weekend um, I have a field trip. So we're going to Southern Indiana. We're gonna be looking at some outcrops and looking at some um, Pennsylvanian and Mississippian uh, carbonates. So um, I'll be driving most of the day for a um, uh, for field trip and, and whatever. So um, great. And uh, yes, carboniferous carbonates, exactly, um, for said strat. So, um, should be fun. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's getting late and, uh, and I want to just wish everybody a good night and then we'll, uh, we'll go raid, uh, sand experiment. So we'll see you next time, hopefully. <laughs>